In 1997, in the city, there's a raging heat wave, an incredible drug war in the streets between the Colombians and the Jamaicans and the police trying to intervene. And the predators have always chosen heat and conflict, where the action is, where the danger is. What would it be like to have an extraterrestrial uh, dilettante hunter hunt us the same way that we go to Africa and hunt big game? Uh, that was the very first concept. The first one was set in Central America, where a lot of military action was taking place. Had it been 20 years before that, it probably would have been someplace like Vietnam or Cambodia. You feel like you're watching one of Arnold's, you know, action flicks, and then all of a sudden, out of left field comes this alien. When we were in the jungle, we always talked about what possible sequels there might be, and one of the fantasies we had is what would this what would this camouflage effect look like? What would the predator look like in an urban environment? What would he look like against concrete and steel in the, in the city? So we, that was one of the things that we always toyed around with. The writers had done the first one, and, and so they knew the story really clearly, and so that was really helpful. And I don't think they'd quite finished the script when I first came on. They really talked me through it, and then they showed me where they were. And um, because it was happened so quickly, then I worked with them you know, and I'd be storyboarding sequences to see how these sequences could work. Uh, they knew what the sequences wanted to be, they just hadn't completely described them all. It's always a question with sequels. So many times they have a tendency to, you know, to beat the same idea to death again. You know, it's not just an alien movie, it's not just a horror movie, it's a detective story, it's a mystery, it's a science fiction story, it's an action movie, and it crosses over into a lot of different genres. This is quite cerebral and you get a sense of, of uh, uh, who this this otherworldly being is, and his and I, and I don't use the word monster, uh, otherworldly being is, and his 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 train his, his uh, train of thought. I think the first Predator was uh, a terrific experience for for all the moviegoers because it was a terrific creature. But it went to the jungle, and the jungle is something we may see on the news, but it's not really part of our daily lives because we all live in the cities and suburbs. And I think this movie really hits home because it shows the dangers of the city. It shows where we may be headed if we're not careful with our, with our air and our, our, our crime and our violence in the streets. Basically what happens is, you know, this creature realizes that this is a place to party. This is hot stuff in the city. Like a redneck on a weekend and goes hunting for trophies and fun. And uh, hopes to leave with enough stuff to impress his friends. The, the predator is now in an urban environment rather than in the jungle. And uh, actually it's left it much more wide open for planning of stunts because we have motor vehicles and, and buildings and, and large expanses between buildings that he can leap and jump down from tall buildings to lower buildings and stuff, where in the jungle we were somewhat limited to just the trees and the, and the bushes and things. He's off on a wild trip. This one is not doing what normal predators do, you know, which is hunt and go by the rules. He's definitely breaking all the rules. So he's a wild boy. All of a sudden he gets turned around, right? Yeah, there's a reversal in this movie. The humans are being hunted. It's about time. That's kind of a universal statement here. Up until the 20s or 30s or 40s in this planet, hunting was very much a manly and a heroic thing to do and never thought of as, um, as detrimental to the environment or, or uh, sadistic in any way. And like you say, it's a reversal in that way. I don't think this creature sees it as a, as a, a wrong thing to do. He sees it as an honorable opportunity. In terms of the environment, I mean, what if, it, it's a, what if it's 110 degrees all over the world in 1997? We could be headed that way. Who knows? But anyway, these outer world life forces that come in uh, have these self-defense mechanisms that they can exist anywhere, anytime, any place. And if they get cornered or confused, they will terminate themselves rather than being captured. And this is what my character knows. And it's a delicate job trailing him. And we have all kinds of sensor 
computers to test his heat and to see where he is, to find out where his spacecraft is, to find out where he eats, what he eats, where he's going to hit next, what his patterns of decomposing the enemy is, and who he's after. And I want to get in here, and I set up the last mission, which was the CIA commission in the jungles. And that's how we lost uh, the character that Arnold played. We lost him nine weeks after the, after the movie was over. That's why he's not here. So Arnold went off to do Terminator 2, which, which is a much bigger project with one of the great directors in the world. And uh, I think in a way it was interesting not to have Arnold in it, you know, because it just made it a really different piece. This is what I call the speech, kid. It's the only one I got. I only give it once, so pay attention. Till now, it's all been fun and games, cops and robbers, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> but you're in the shit now. Well, I, th I think Harrigan rhymes with arrogant in some sort of way, and I, th I think this this cop is is somewhat that. He's he's full of his own, you know. He um, he says he lives in a rough time, a rough period, and he says, these are my streets, and, and I want to know what's going on. Danny's got a big heart. He's a wonderful, giving actor. We did Lethal Weapon 1 together, then we traveled to Japan and China and Australia together, promoting it. Working with Danny, I have to tell you, he's been such a hero of mine. It was the same way with, you know, working with Arnold on the first pictures. You see these people, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're opposite them. Danny has got such good energy and he's always so committed, you know, when he's chasing me, you know, <laughs> he's really after me. When I'm after him, he's really running. It's been really fun. It's been fun. I really wanted to work with Danny. Uh, I kind of felt like if we had um, an actor who you weren't used to being in these sort of roles, but who had this kind of strong physicality, that he might bring something to a character that really didn't have much chance to, to really, you know, you didn't have much chance to find out about him. I found it kind of interesting to be playing opposite him because it's almost like I felt like I was watching him on TV or something. It's like, oh wait, it's my line now? But no, he's, he's, he's very centered, he's very methodical, and uh, he's almost like hypnotic in his acting. It brings so you in so much that you really can't help but listen one, to him one. if he's talking to you in a scene, which is the best thing that you can possibly be doing is actually really listening. Now don't get me wrong, we need good cops down here and they say you're good at what you do. But the team comes first. That's it. It's like making a cake. And he's got a good content of batter and a variation of spices that go into making a performance. Danny's got the energy to put forth life on the celluloid. You don't know what you're dealing with. And I'm warning you, stay the fuck out of my way. It's wonderful to be uh, uh, to work with Gary again. It's like family again, you know. It's, it's always nice about this business. Sometimes you get a chance, but often you don't. But sometimes you get a chance to, to work with people who you admire and people that you've worked with before. I guess you're wondering what we're doing here in these barbecue outfits. Well, it's easy. We're going in after another world life force from another galaxy that has a self-defense mechanism that we don't understand. It's intangible to this time and space. It's actually from the theory of relativity and from the theory of quantum mechanics. Take those properties and equalize them, and you have the quantum theory of gravity, which is the discussion of how this universe started and how it will end. The predator knows that information already. It is our job and our objective to go capture the predator, sit him down, have a talk with him, find out why he does what he does, how he does what he does, and where he gets the weaponry and the defense mechanisms he uses in order to obtain his goal. And that is our goal. If we don't achieve that goal, we will be turned into vapor clouds made of small pink particles known on Earth as blood. Gary Busey had worked on Lethal Weapon with Joel, so he really wanted, you know, him to be in the film, and you know, which I was completely happy about because he's quite a character. No, I think it was good for the team. I just need my glasses! <laughs> <laughs> David Lassie, you see what happens? You get in the movies and what happens? You get some sunglasses, it costs $5,000. You lose them in the chopper, they take them away, you never see them again. They say it's an e-ticket ride, but it's not. It's a Fox ticket ride, and I'm having a ball. But Gary hadn't done a film for a couple of years because he had a terrible motorcycle accident, which he was very lucky to survive, and in fact died for a while, and regaled us with all these stories about what it felt like, the afterlife. December 4th, 1988, at 1.15 in the afternoon, I hit the concrete going 45 knots. 
and I had some out-of-body experiences and I went to the other side. So there's a real curious element in what is out of this world, and we're just merely a speck in the whole thing. He's just such a huge character. It was, uh, it was great to have him playing a role that otherwise would have been played by some nerdy scientific, you know, kind of feeling person. Lions, the tigers, the bears. Oh, my. Trophies. That's the game, isn't it, Keys? You're the lion. This is his jungle. Hold one second. I can't remember the name of my <laughs> of my partner. What's Bill? Bill? Paxton? Bill Paxton. Okay. Okay. So the team is Danny Glover and Ruben Blades and Billy Paxton and myself. And we are the four detectives that are fighting this uh, mafioso stuff. She kind of reminded me mostly of more of this policewoman that I knew who we were using as a, as a, a consultant. Maria was kind of like, she said, well, I, don't, I, I can't get to know you too well. You know, we're not supposed to like each other in the movie. I'm her new partner, and I've got this reputation for being a real uh, loner. Yeah, and the idea that I got a partner hurt or killed before I came to this division, and she's worried about that. You try that cowboy shit with me, oh. fucking you can kiss this. Goodbye. Got it? Uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, I love it when she puts on her, 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 you know, her tough thing with me because underneath, I know she's just a really genuinely sweet, warm, affectionate person. Maria Conchita Alonso is a Venezuelan actress who is also an accomplished musician. I met her in Venezuela many years ago as a musician. At the time, she was also working uh, in uh, television. She was doing soap operas. Maria and I have the same birthday. And she loves onions and garlic. She's a lovely singer. Gary Busey is also here, but he's, the predator is not after him. Oh! He's after me, but... The <laughs> so, there he is, uh huh? He's, he's... That's really an onion. It looks like an Oreo, but it's an onion. This girl loves onion and garlic because that's the only thing the predator will go for. So she eats onions and garlic. They look like Oreos, and I'm not kidding you. If I was kidding you, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somewhere else in a different suit of clothes working in a regular job. Gary, Thank you very much. Here, what? have your cookie. Thanks, I'll see you You're later. welcome. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody says shit like Maria. <laughs> I've been feeling like shit the whole week. You feel like shit. <laughs> no, but with Ruben, it's my second time around with Ruben. And, and it, it was a joy the first time. And, and Ruben's my brother in a way. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's equally a joy this time. And I'm playing Danny Archuleta. He's a detective here in uh, Los Angeles. I'm a partner uh, with uh, Danny Glover. I knew of Ruben, uh, Ruben Blades, who's this great rock singer and this, this up and coming politician in Panama at the time. And he is just so natural. I kind of felt it was great to have someone like himself, someone you didn't expect in that role. And so not everyone was like these huge, you know, hunky, enormous, you know, bodybuilders. He's got the essence of purity in terms of performing what the content of his character is and where he is going in his mind and heart is his character. Chiefs La Victoria, Chiefs to die for. <laughs> one night we, were, we had you know a few days shooting crammed into one location and the sun was coming up and we'd got almost everything and we had this enormous camera set up. It was you know a, a vehicle with a crane on top with another crane on top of that and the camera fell about 100 feet and followed Ruben through this elaborate you know, car park and we had to make it simpler because you know, it was, as the light was coming up, we weren't able to shoot. There was, there was no way we'd come back to that location. So I went out, no one could tell me where he was. I went out and I saw him being interviewed. And of course, the actors are being interviewed all the time, you know, and then you take them off the interviews and they go back to interviews afterwards. And I couldn't understand, you know, I was saying to the first assistant, Josh McLagden, who's my friend, said, what's going on with this guy? We're waiting for inside, we're ready. And you know, this guy's being interviewed and now give me an answer. So I rushed across and I just grabbed him and said, Ruben, we're gonna go. And he kind of ignored me. And everyone ignored me, so I didn't know what was going on. I said, guys, we have to shoot. And I kind of grabbed the earpiece and helped him out of the chair. So look, and I started talking you know, what about the scene was about and walking away with him. And it was, you know, dawn, last shot. I go home. I wake up that night to do the next night shooting with like 100,000 messages in the answering machine because I didn't realize I'd taken him off live. Off, um, he was being interviewed by Joan London from New York Live on Good Morning America. And uh, so I was in deadly trouble because I you know, cursed on screen in front of many millions of people. And it looked like I treated Ruben badly, who was a sort of a Latino icon. And, and you know, I got 
death threats on the phone and all sorts of terrible things and of course I didn't mean to do any of that so we shot the next night and then after shooting the next night Ruben and I went to a, a studio in downtown LA and uh, and we were going to do something mischievous like have a fight but we didn't and we just and then I had to talk to a camera and we got interviewed by Joan London from New York and actually since then they've never done a live interview that was the last one they've ever done but I was very famous for about 10 minutes. So. Yeah, let's get the rest though. We can. We just got orders from Chief Heinem and he says secure perimeter, surround building, and wait. Wait? For what? I don't know. Some bullshit special unit, the feds, the DEA. I play a, a character, his name is um, Detective Jerry Lambert. He's the new kid on the block. And Bill Paxton had been in a couple of Jim Cameron films and a, a few things I'd seen. He was just so funny and so outrageous and just so didn't care about you know, putting out this huge performance, so it was fun. So I went in to meet him, and uh, I put on this suit that I thought maybe the character would wear. I, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll go in with an L in a costume. I don't want these directors to have to stretch their imagination too much, you know? So I went in, we had a great meeting. It was really um, just a good rapport, it was just a good vibe, and I felt like it went really well. And I expected to be called back to, to read for the part. Two days later, I found out I had an offer which really thrilled me. That, that meant a lot to me. That meant that the director had met me, he knew my previous work, and I mean, he had seen Near Dark and Alien 7, and he just said, yeah, I want, I want Bill Paxton. And that, that's the greatest thing an actor can have going into a movie. Bill Paxton, he's got the energy of a government mule. I'll handle it. PR's my specialty. That's just that word they want your ass off the job. Tony, my man! Who the hell are you? Your biggest fan! How you doing, everybody? I'm Morton Downey Jr. In Predator 2, I play a gorilla-like street reporter by the name of Anthony Pope. Well, Morton was um, sort of quite the celebrity pre-Jerry Springer character at the time, and and he had that a very he had an outrageous TV show. He would bring people on who were who were deliberately abrasive and political and loud and and then he would attack them on the camera and, and scream at them. It was all play acting, it was all made up. He makes quite a splash in the film. And he's definitely the guy you wanna, you know, punch out. Hey, more victims, more mutilation! Fuck you! Kevin Indom was the, the guy in Hollywood who did all the big stuff. He did Predator, he did, um, what's the movie with the giant? I played Harry in Harry and the Hendersons. Harry and the Hendersons he'd done. And he spent really a lot of his time, you know, manipulating these suits and there was no one really like him. I did a movie called Without Warning, which was about an alien that comes to Earth to hunt man. <laughs> so I guess I've done Predator three or four times. He was very tall and he was super smart and he was a great, um, he had a great mime physicality. Most of my film career has been creature career, whereas most of my television, I've never played a monster on television, uh, except for the gong show when I played Frankenstein. He understood the shape and, and, and mime very well. We try other people in the suit and it just wouldn't be the same. He, he understood so clearly what it was and he was always in, in charge of that side of it. And so it was great for me not to, great for me to walk into a film where he had such a command of that. We love you, Kevin. You're letting me be on film. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're not in the movie. <laughs> I'm Stan Winston. This is John Rosengrant. This is Shane Mahan. They made me what and I am today. I want you to know that this man was four foot eleven before we met him. <laughs> That's right. This is, huh? this, these, are, these are the guys that make me the monster. Uh, is that know? a camera? <laughs> that's, that, that's a camera. Oh, gosh. I've worked for the Stan Winston studio for over 20 years, and I was part of the team that actually created the first Predator, which led to our involvement in Predator 2. <coughs> <sighs> 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 
probably the most important aspect of, uh, of all the work I do in uh, creating these creatures is the fact that I don't do any of it and that uh, these are the people that actually do it and have been uh, making me look good for a lot of years. Shane Mahan and John Rosengrant, who are the head of my art department, have been with me for too many years. Who are work and the life of it is from Richard Landon in the back there, who's the head of the mechanical department. So we have the aspect of the art that it takes to make the creature and the art that it takes to make the creature live. These are the most important aspects of all of the creatures we do. Broad concept the same. The difference is that this is a different individual. A different individual of the same species. As is a snake is a snake is a snake. But different snakes are different. Their colorings are different. Different parts of their characteristics, their facial structures, subtle differences. Now, to the average public, this predator will look like the same predator as Predator 1 because to the average public, they all look alike. Our involvement in Predator 2 was exciting because we got to further our characters and kind of flesh them out and, and figure out more of the Predator's culture because there was going to be multiples in this movie. Bring back the Predator, but bring back a new Predator. Make him be a little bit more dynamic than the first. Give back the audience what they saw originally, but give them a little bit more. Since he'll be in the movie more, he needs to have more character. He needs to have more life in his face. We, we had the fortunate first film to learn what we would like to do better. And now, fortunately, we have the second film, and we can do those things that we weren't able to do in the first film. They knew the film was going to be made, so he'd been working on it. I want to say, I think it was three months, somewhere around that, on, on Predator 2. So you're building and creating all that. Then when you go to the set, your, your, your duties become making sure that the suit is maintained, looks artistically correct, that at the time it was Kevin Peter Hall inside the suit, that he's comfortable. And then you're there puppeteering his face when his mask is off because you're articulating his brows and the exterior mandibles. It was Kevin's eyes with contact lenses inside. It was a, a very tight-fitting mask that would cinch it down around his eyes. And then you were going to see a lot more of the Predator in the second one. And be it whether it's in dark situations or not, it, was, it still had to be very carefully regulated. The last thing you want to do is see a really huge guy walking, clambering around in, you know, in, in a giant suit. In, in creating the suits, we, we had to do it slightly differently this time than we did the first time around. First time around, a lot of the armor that was on the Predator was part of his suit. So he put the whole thing on and most of it was intact. Because we were going to create many Predators that had to look different, we ended up uh, having only basic pieces of armor on him, and the whole chest and the whole harness that holds the gun pack. And all. That became separate. And I think it created uh, a more realistic look because I, I think in Predator 2 we're going to spend more time looking at these characters than in the first movie, so it's better to have all those separate and kind of moving and functioning and would actually clip on. And then by having the Predator bodies without the armor on them, the naked chests, it allowed us for the background ones or the ones that would be seen later, you could augment them by putting different armor on in a mix and match fashion. On Predator 2, I just remember us going through cases and cases of uh, Predator blood. It was an interesting mix of the Siloom sticks, glow sticks, that when you, you break them and you, you, all the ingredients would then go into a cup with KY jelly. And that would give us the pasty glowing blood. So he gets wounded many times in this. So there was just times on set where we were just mixing up gops of this stuff, putting it all over. Then you'd have to, in between takes, you'd have to mix up another set of it because it would only last for a finite amount of time. That's how the blood was done in the first one as well. Stuff that you, they used to break off and go to raves with or whatever they would do was uh, the Predator's blood. We 
are now <coughs> shooting Predator 2 in Los Angeles rather than the jungles of Palenque, Mexico, makes our job much easier. Uh, we're home, and uh, unfortunately, the Predator's here with us. Well, shooting downtown at nighttime still has a lot of the same problems as it did then, because uh, I've been now shut down this since then for Judgment Night, for 24, for all sorts of movies. And, you know, you book places down there and you, and you tell residents, but in the end, no one really wants you there all night, making a noise all the time. So um, since then and during then, you know, when you go downtown, you run a, you know, a gauntlet. You, uh, you know, you get things thrown at you, bottles of piss or uh, bags full of human shit. And which is a pretty good trick if you think about it. That's that's pretty good at putting you off. Um, you know, we were cleaning out alleyways down there to shoot in, and you know, we'd find dead bodies under the garbage, and there were giant rats down there, which the grips would delight in putting on leashes because they look like small dogs and walk them around. And nowadays, I don't think we'd be able to do a lot of things we did then, which we'd be shooting in the streets with explosions. Um, we'd have you know helicopters landing in the street, you know, which is absolutely unheard of now. I'm not sure if you could get away with doing half the stuff on rooftops and nighttime and shooting and you know there were those shots would ring out around you. In those days it was a lot more dangerous to shoot down there than it is now too. One of the stunts we have in our film that uh, that we considered a high-risk situation was when the predator is hanging on the side of a building 150 feet high and uh, he's fighting with Danny Glover and Danny severs his arm. That's the only thing holding the predator onto the building so the predator falls we used a device called the Descender. It's a wire that we put him on and actually drop him at speed and then break him real quick before he gets to the ground. And the gentleman we used, Dave Smith, is a one-armed stuntman who lives in San Diego who came up to play the Predator for that day. And he had never even seen a Descender work before. So on top of preparing everything, I had to also make sure that he was real comfortable with it too. He had to be really brave for that because we were actually up on a 13-story building and he's on uh, like a descender rig where he comes flying down that building after that arm gets cut off. So we were all up 13 stories working on that scene where Denny Glover is there and Kevin is there and we're all kind of working on the edge of that building you know, to get that real effect. Uh, not sure they do it exactly like that nowadays. Everything was safe, we were all lashed had like cables on us and whatever so we couldn't fall off but you still sometimes get that weird vertigo feeling looking down 13 stories but Dave had to take that that fall coming down which is pretty wild I'm real excited. Today is a great day to talk because uh, it's the climax scene. It's the last scene in the movie, and it's the final confrontation between the Predator and Danny. And you get to see the spacecraft, which is so fabulous, you know. So we're all really jazzed. I mean, it's really buzzing here today. What you come to realize is there is um, underground in Los Angeles a spaceship, and it's a it's a spaceship housing our Predator. The spaceship, you know, took a long time to design and. Once again, it wasn't the biggest budget in the world. It wasn't like a Terminator film or something. So we, so Larry kind of came up with this idea of like these backlit polystyrene things, and, and we were all interested because of the history of the Predator of, of Mayan architecture and and all the Mayan um, graphics and all the temples and stuff in Mexico where and South America where you see a lot of the representations of their gods look like spacemen in in space uh, capsules, you know chariot of the gods kind of stuff. So it's, it's something that I don't think you've seen in quite a long time. A very functional, smart, strong, utilitarian, you know, alien craft, very much like the Predator itself, you know, mimicking its, you know, movements and camouflage and being a real great combination of organic and primitive, reptilian, little touches of Aztec and Mayan. And it's almost like it's a weapon itself. You know, we put dry ice in just to make it feel like a hot, sort of environment that they came from, sort of steamy and stuff. I had a steam room put in my house. 
and you know, it's recent, you know, it's new. I gotta get some of the kinks out of it. But it gets all the impurities out of the body, you know? I mean, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, you should see some of the things I've been able to do, some of the things I've been able to do and collect with my steamer. Over here, for example. We're all gonna look like this one day, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> don't be frightened. I mean, don't be perturbed because uh, I showcase this, but it gives me a sense of um, a completeness and living back to nature, you know? And these are some artifacts that I've collected. And, uh, makes a nice little accommodation to this wonderful steam room. You know, you're invited over. Uh, if you get a chance, I mean, you're gonna have a ball. I think the idea of putting the alien head in the film was stand originally, it was a great idea. And there's a sequence in the middle of the film where he cuts off the head of the Jamaican gang leader guy. And you see him cleaning the head and preparing it for his trophy. We just kind of went wild and fabricated a bunch of different alien skeletons and whatever to go in that case. And kind of a nod to that comic that was going on at the time. We did uh, an alien skull and put it in there. Just kind of an inside fun thing. And originally you saw the alien head there and then you see it again at the end. But then when we cut it together, we thought, if you put the alien head there, we wondered if that was going to, you think that that's going to start off a different storyline. So we cut it out of the first bit, but at the end you see it pretty clearly, but we kind of throw it away a bit. We don't concentrate too much on it. We just leave it as a part. There's other great skulls up there too, of these gigantic monsters, you know, so beautifully made. Winston really did an incredible job on this film. They did so much stuff that you, unless you really study the film, like all the details and the costumes of the, of trinkets and artifacts and jewelry that they've taken from people that they've killed, you know, and it really builds up on the costumes. And if you look closely and feels like that they've had a history, you know, and that's very important that you stop people looking at the rubber. The shot at the end with the, all the predators appearing was an incredibly expensive outing. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars at the time because we had to have all the different predators. And once we are in suits, so we had to have suits for everyone, which is really expensive. And then we had to shoot them all against blue screen and green screen separately over and over again for different reasons. And they were standing in dry hours, which was a pain in the ass. And Danny was a huge Lakers fan. And because it was so long ago now, I can't remember exactly who we got for the costumes. But I know Danny asked the Lakers. I think we got a couple of the Lakers at the time to come and be in the costumes because we needed these really tall guys who are athletic and, and, and who could support a huge amount of weight. There's an older one who's the main guy and then there's sort of younger, groovier ones and slimmer ones and different colored ones. Each artist that was working here kind of had one that I said, you know, you come up with, you know, here's some general paint schemes, ideas, and you know, you add your touches to this one and you decorate them with your own jewelry or, or whatever you want to do to it. And so, you know, each one became a fun project for, for all the, the artists working on it. The uh, elder predator, we call them the gray back, you know, kind of like a silver back kind of idea. That was generated out of the old predator mold. And we made some different appliances to go on his face with some extra ridges and to just cha change him. But if the fans out there look carefully at his suit and everything, even though he's got a different paint scheme and we kind of dressed him slightly different, that's the the original predator that's been kind of doctored up. So his sh head shape is a little different. It's more like the original one. And just some tweaks added to him. And it's Kevin playing that character. Take it. The film was never finished till the last second. There are no audience previews. You know, we just about made our 70 mil print for the premiere. I mean, it was still wet when we were showing it. It was such a long, complicated post because of all the effects. And um, that you, you know, I look at it now and I change things, you know. <laughs> I change loads of stuff I see now. And, and uh, I mean, my, my filmmaking style is completely different, but at the time it was just a riot. I just had the best time.